Good morning and welcome. And today I would ask you, our congregation of Burwood Heights, to welcome the Reverend Kevin Dobson, who is our supply minister sent from Presbytery. And some of you may already know Kevin because he also assisted at our sister church at Forest Hill Uniting. So please, one and all, welcome the Reverend Kevin Dobson. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Our worship this morning is meeting in the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners. I'd also like to pay my respects to their elders, past and present and emerging. This week we begin the season of Advent, a season when we wait, long for, promise and prepare. Today marks the first Sunday of Advent, a Sunday of hope. Hope born into our world 2,000 years ago. Hope born again at this time of year. Hope born with the sound of every new cry as a baby is born. Yet sometimes hope seems far away, far from our homes, our churches, our communities, our world. Creator, May your hope be reborn in all places of conflict. Redeemer, may your light of hope shine bright. Sustainer, may your hope be born in us this morning. So let us worship our God, three in one, one in three. Let's pray. It's Advent time again. It's a time for excitement. It's a time for impatient waiting. It's a time that children love when they become the centre of attention for the adults of our world. In our church, it's a time of getting ready to remember and celebrate the story of the birth of the baby Jesus. It's a time to decorate our building to plan parties, to wrap presents, to rehearse nativities and to look forward to holidays from school. It's a time to remember the children in our world who, like Moses and Jesus did, live in dangerous places, who struggle to have enough to eat or a place to sleep or access to education or health care. In this time of Advent, may we be grateful for all that we have and look for ways that we can share what we have with others and help children around the world who have little to celebrate at this time of year. So be it. Amen.
This week's scriptures invite us into a time of waiting by reminding us to stay alert for signs of new life, even as we give thanks for what God has already done. Advent is a reminder that even as we remember all that God has done for us, we are still waiting for a time when the brokenness of our world will be transformed in the fullness of God's reign. So let us adore God and confess our sin. Let us pray. Life-giving God, you amaze us in so many ways. The miracle of pregnancy and birth, the wonder of a newborn child, the fragility of a helpless babe still amazes and confuses us. Despite the dangers in our world, new life continues to come forth and parents all over the world are learning the joys and pains of parenthood. As we enter into this time of Advent, waiting to celebrate once more the birth of your son Jesus, we thank you for the wonder of childbirth, the joy of the cries of a newborn baby. Every child is a gift. Every child deserves love and a family. Every child needs to be nurtured. Every child should be welcomed and treated equally with all other children. Forgive us, God, as we watch so many children facing lives apart from their natural families, so poor that they cannot receive the nurture they need shunned because of the colour of their skin or because of where they were born. Forgive us for standing by and doing nothing. Help us to find ways to pray and to take an active role in protecting all the children in the world. Fill us with compassion and a desire to do all in our power that each child, each person, may receive the love and care they need. So be it. Amen. Loving God, in our busy and thing-filled world, you call us to be patient. You invite us to trust in your everlasting word. Strengthen us, we pray, to hear your word to believe your word and to respond to your word in our daily living. Amen. Our readings for Advert 1. Sisters and brothers, the word of God, made flesh in Mary's womb, will come forth to heal us and make all things new. Our first reading is the Hebrew scriptures of Jeremiah, chapter 33, verses 14 to 16. The Lord said, I made a wonderful promise to Israel and Judah, and the days are coming when I will keep it. I promise that the time will come when I will appoint a king from the family of David, a king who will be honest and rule with justice. In those days, Judah will be safe. Jerusalem will have peace and will be named the Lord gives justice. Our second reading is a letter to the church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 9 to 13. How can we possibly thank God enough for all the happiness you have brought us? Day and night, we sincerely pray that we will see you again and help you to have an even stronger faith. 
we pray that God our Father and our Lord Jesus will let us visit you. May the Lord make you love for each other and for everyone else grow by leaps and bounds. That's how our love for you has grown. And when our Lord comes with all his people, I pray that he will make your hearts pure and innocent in the sight of God the Father. And our Gospel comes from Luke chapter 21, verses 25 to 36. Strange things will happen to the sun, moon and stars. The nations on earth will be afraid of the roaring sea and tides and they won't know what to do. People will be so frightened that they will faint because of what is happening to the world. Every power in the sky will be shaken. Then the Son of Man will be seen coming in a cloud with great power and glory. When all of this starts happening, stand up straight and be brave. You will soon be set free. Then Jesus told them a story. When you see a fig tree or other tree putting out leaves, you know that summer will soon come. So when you see these things happening, you know that God's kingdom will soon be here. You can be sure that some of the people of this generation will still be alive when all of this takes place. The sky and the earth won't last forever, but my words will. Don't spend all of your time thinking about eating or drinking or worrying about life. If you do, the final day will suddenly catch you like a trap. That day will surprise everyone on earth. Watch out and keep praying that you can escape all that is going to happen and that the Son of Man will be pleased with you. Lord, may your word live in us and bear much fruit to your glory. It's Advent again drive around the streets, go into the shops, decorations are everywhere, something's happening. It's the season where we're orientated in everyday life as well as liturgically towards Christmas. And yet, there are some stops that we must make along the way. In today's stop point, our readings look forward to Jesus' triumphant return. Today, we look to the apocalypse, the final coming. The prophecy from Jeremiah signals the coming of the fulfilment of God's promise when all shall live in peace and justice. This era of justice and flourishing for all people we can all probably agree, has not yet come to pass. The coming Messiah was meant to usher in this age of peace on earth, end to war and an end to the woes of humanity. And yet, in our Gospel reading, Luke has Jesus telling us that this time has not yet come. Instead, he's declaring prophecies of distress, roaring of waves, fear and foreboding. 
This time of distress of the Son of Man's return is not far away in the future, according to Jesus who teaches, Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Reading this sentence plainly or literally surely is a bit embarrassing. A bit embarrassing not for us, but for Jesus as well. It certainly seems like he's saying that his return will be imminent. Here we are nearly 2,000 years later and the second coming of Jesus has still not occurred. So is Jesus wrong? Our impulse is to rush to the answer, no. We want to rush to the explanation of how this surely was not what Jesus would have meant. We want a clarification that meshes with our ideas of orthodoxy and our theological commitments. We want to say, as we all too often do, now that's not what Jesus meant. We are not good at waiting. We want to rush for answers. We want to rush for explanations. But to be seasonal, let us engage with the text using an Advent understanding of our interpretation of Scripture. Thus, in this season of waiting, let us hold off from that immediate jump to making this make sense. Instead, let us wait. Let us sit with the discomfort that these passages bring us. Was Jesus wrong? What would it mean if Jesus were wrong about this? His generation certainly did pass away before seeing him returning, descending on a cloud with power and great glory. If he were wrong, would that change the way we see Jesus as fully divine? If we maintain that Jesus was fully divine, but wrong about the timing of the apocalypse, would it change the way we think of divine omniscience? If Jesus were wrong about the timing, could he have been wrong about other aspects of the great return? These questions are not easy to sit with. And yet, they are important questions to ask, especially for that generation to whom Jesus was speaking. Imagine being part of that first generation of Jesus' followers. Jesus has promised that he would return, but now people are dying, and understandably the church is a bit confused. These questions we've been raising, these are the questions that the community in Thessalonica was asking as well. Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians is about precisely this issue. Jesus was expected to have come back before this generation passed away. Now people are dying and the community is concerned about the place those who have passed will have in the coming kingdom. When is Jesus coming back? Was Jesus wrong? Is Jesus coming back at all? Has Jesus left us alone with our death and our suffering? Words from today's psalm surely capture some of the anxiety. My God, I put my trust in you. Let me not be humiliated nor let my enemies triumph over me. And what enemy seems more triumphant than death? Weren't you supposed to come by now? Weren't you supposed to come to save us? 
Now these are the questions that come up while we sit with this conundrum using our Advent lens. Paul's response to the Thessalonians is simultaneously theological and pastoral. And further on in the letter, he addresses the community's fear about those who have already died, affirming that they will experience resurrection and have a place in the coming kingdom of God. He also acknowledges those feelings of grief, helplessness and powerlessness that accompany that feeling that God has abandoned or forgotten us. He declares that we wait in faith. During the season of Advent, it's a time of waiting. It's taking time to look around and recognise that all is not as it should be or could be. Waiting is a time when we lean into those feelings of longing. Waiting is to dream dreams, to see visions and to hope. We dream of the time when God is going to make everything right. To echo the words of Jeremiah, we dream of a time when God's promise is fulfilled and all will live in safety and in flourishing. We dream of a day when God will execute justice and righteousness throughout the land. So in these coming weeks of Advent, we move with Mary and Elizabeth, with John, with Zechariah, towards Bethlehem. We come waiting for a promised one who will bring hope to our world. We believe in Christmas, but let us also believe in Advent. What does it mean to believe in Advent? To believe in Advent is to believe in waiting. And may our waiting be full of dreams for a better world, full of God's justice and love made present to all. And may God bless us as we go on this journey. To God's name be the praise and the glory now and always. Amen. Let us offer our prayers for others and ourselves. God, in this Advent season of hope and expectation, may we carry your hope into our lives chilled by unrelenting darkness. May we encourage others to expect good things and then ensure by what we do that they may not be disappointed. There is so much darkness in our world, so many folk for whom hope has long been extinguished. The darkness of war and injustice, of oppression and want, the darkness of fear and rejection, of violence and hate, the darkness of loss and loneliness, of longing and need, the darkness of COVID-19, that we may treat one another with love and respect. So much darkness and so little hope. Lift up our eyes, O God, those of the downcast, Rekindle hope that has all but died. Do a new thing, O oh God. Confound our expectations and surprise us with joy. The joy of those who know that the God of Advent comes to change the world. And with Jesus, we join the prayer he gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. Amen.
It's certainly a joy to be able to be with you during these next few weeks. I look forward to getting to know you, to help you prepare for Christmas and celebrate Christmas. It's a great time. And as we go from here, I invite you to stand up with Jesus, to raise your heads, for your redemption is drawing near. Let us go from here with courage to face the struggles of our world, knowing that Jesus is coming to make all things new. Let us go to prepare the way of Christ. And may hope be reborn in you today. May hope be reborn in the world tomorrow. And may hope be reborn so heaven may be glimpsed here on the earth. So go with the hope of God, born into this world of sorrow and conflict. And may the hope be with you today, tomorrow and evermore. And may the living God bless you. In the name of the one who creates, the one who comes and the one who empowers you. May the feet of God walk with you.